when you fall down, you have to get back up. When is it gonna happen to me? It's hard to have patience. I mean, it is. If you really want it bad enough, you cannot skip steps. Be grateful for what you got. If you really want to get on that grind and you don't like your job, I'm still cooking the bacon. Because you're always going to be wondering what if. Damn, I'm only here for one reason and one reason only, though. Patience starts now. Thank you for tuning in to episode six of Patience the Podcast with your host, Donnie D. And your host, Sammy G. What's up, guys? Got a very special guest on the show today. She is a mother of two. She's a former elementary school teacher, a positive discipline educator. She hosts mindfulness and parenting workshops centered around finding calm in the chaos of daily life. She's an aspiring author, formerly known as Mindful Ninja Mom, Laura Lynn Knight. Welcome to Patience of Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's a real pleasure to have you on the show. We are lucky to have somebody who's got so much expertise as a parent. Uh, So for all those that are parents out there, parents-to-be, those people that are looking for equanimity in their life and mindfulness, uh, we just feel like you're the perfect guest to have on the show and uh, a real great vehicle to add a little bit of anxiety and stress relief and equanimity and mindfulness into daily living as a parent. Take us a little bit into your background as a former teacher uh, turned positive discipline educator and motivational speaker. What are some of the experiences and the values that gave birth to your brand as the Mindful Ninja Mom and as you currently go by Laura Lynn Knight? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. And, you know, my path into mindfulness really began in high school because I was diagnosed with a pretty serious health condition and the doctors thought that I was going to die and my hair was falling out and I was skin and bones and um, I was misdiagnosed with a disease that I didn't actually have. And then I was sent off to college. And so after that experience, I figured out over time that I didn't have this disease, but I was left with a lot of fear and anxiety in my mid twenties. I was kind of just debilitated by this fear and anxiety. And so that was when I discovered mindfulness and meditation tools because I really personally needed to find a way to decrease my stress. Um, But what happened was that, you know, the pain of that situation actually became one of my greatest assets because in learning about mindfulness and meditation skills, I really started to not only have my fear dissipate, but I found that I had this practice that I could share with others. And so that set me on the path to teaching mindfulness and meditation. And then, you know, I I went on to become an elementary school teacher and I had these two beautiful children. And I kind of thought that I was going to have the upper hand as a parent, because honestly, you know, I had been the school teacher, kids really loved me. I had always had a strong rapport with children. But when my son was three, he started trying to hit me and when he would get angry. And I was shocked. And, um, you know, your podcast focused on patience and I had no patience. I mean, to be totally honest, I had a three-year-old and then a brand new baby and my son's trying to hit me. And I would kind of vacillate between getting really angry with him and having this authoritarian approach or Mm -hmm. just being super passive. I was, you know, like, oh, it's fine. All feelings are valid. (laughs) And, um, I couldn't find a middle ground. And so that was when I realized I needed to use mindfulness tools as a parent, right? Like I needed to be grounded myself. And so that kind of set me on this path of teaching tools to parents that really work, um, that are rooted in positive discipline, which is my specialty. And then also having this mindful component so that we don't get lost in our own emotions because kids are always mirroring what they see in us. So that's where I am now in my career. You know, it was kind of this unexpected journey. That's so true. I mean, I think a lot of people do miss that very common mirroring of a child's emotion is really, you know, your emotions back at them. Sam and I aren't uh, parents. So this is a little bit more unique to us. I've worked with kids in the past uh, for many years, but 
uh, we don't have any of our own. So I think it's a really unique perspective you're able to offer parents, especially from your perspective going through your, your illness when you were younger. How did you get through that? You must have an accelerated level of patience to be able to go through what you went through in your 20s and then deal with that intense amount of anxiety at such a precocious time in everyone's life. How did you, you know, as I know being, being a teacher is very stressful, but you had to go through the discipline of becoming a teacher and you were still going to those medical complications that I'm assuming at some point during your career. How did you juggle all of that between being a parent, a teacher, and what did you learn in that experience in terms of patience, mindfulness, and equanimity? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I mean, part of that experience, to be honest, was like, you're so powerless. So you just go through it. I mean, to have that kind of health condition and have the kind of testing that I was doing all the time and doctors not knowing what was wrong, uh, there's a certain powerlessness and surrender. Um, and I think acceptance and that really, for me, acceptance ties into patience because for so long in my life, I thought acceptance meant that I had to like something, but acceptance doesn't actually mean that you have to like it. It means that you can be in the reality of what is. And so for me, a lot of my, um, health problems had to do with intestinal problems. And so when you kind of have that intense pain in your intestines and you're doubled over, you know, and you're just feel like you can barely walk for me, it's like, can you, can I accept my current state? Can I breathe into it? Because the more you fight it, the worse it gets, you know, I mean, it's the same with anxiety and stress. The more you fight against it, the louder that voice of stress in your mind becomes. Uh, And so Pema Chodron, she's this famous mindfulness teacher, and she talks about how, you know, you are a mountain observing the weather. And so when a mountain is sitting there, sometimes it's raining and sometimes it's windy, windy and sometimes it's sunny, but the mountain isn't fighting against the weather, right? It's this stable being that's observing the changing climate. And so for me, can I embody that? Can I actually observe the weather of my life, so to speak, as you know, it goes through the different stages and phases and seasons? I learned how to find acceptance. I learned how to be patient. And I learned how to sit in the bad days and know that there would be good days too. How can people listening dig deep into that? Let's say they haven't faced those circumstances. They're still having pretty bad days. How can they sit like that mountain and allow the weather to pass over them without being affected by it? Yeah. Well, you know, I think part of the human condition is that we all have really difficult days, you know, and especially Mm. Uh, as entrepreneurs, I mean, even not as a parent juggling a family and the stress, right? Just trying to start a business or just work life. You know, I do a lot of work with companies now where stress is high and you're trying to have a family life and you're trying to go to work. And, you know, it's a lot that we do in today's society. And so for most of us, for many of us, the way that we begin a practice like this is just to set aside a couple minutes each day to sit. And that can be sitting in a chair, it can be sitting on a mat, it can be sitting on a cushion. And for me, uh, I started by sitting for three minutes each day. That was all I could do. I felt so tense in my body and my mind would be racing. And I had heard people should meditate for 20 minutes a day. And there was no way I was gonna sit and meditate for 20 minutes a day. But I figured I could sit for three minutes. And so I would set my timer and I would sit for three minutes and breathe. I would just notice my breath coming in and out of my body. And we know scientifically speaking now that it only takes four to six deep breaths to actually change our nervous system and that we can have more calm just by taking those breaths. And so for people that are new to this, you know, it could be three minutes in the morning and three minutes at night. And then it might turn into five minutes and 10 minutes. Yeah. Meditation and breathing. And it doesn't even have to be, I mean, it can be meditation. It could just be sitting and noticing your breath, which is a form of meditation, you know, a mindfulness meditation. 
Um, For sure. I mean, I, I'm very familiar with um, a lot of breathing techniques I've had to use in my career. So yeah. I'm sure you know a little bit about the measured breath, the bumblebee breath, the belly breathing. Mm -hmm. They all have different components. There's so many ways to use breathing in your daily life, and it doesn't take a lot of time. And you, I think people really get a little overwhelmed with the idea of how are you supposed to meditate? How are you supposed to breathe? I think it's just yeah. so important to just start where you are and take a few minutes out of your day. We've all got a ton of time every, every single day that we waste. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care who you are, how important you are, what your level of responsibility is for whatever you're doing. You've got time in the day. And literally, like you said, four to six breaths, that's a minute. Mm -hmm. Like, not even. Yeah. So it's, it's just about you know, accepting that that first hurdle is just accepting you can do it several thousand times over, but you got to take that first initial step. Yes, absolutely. And then I would say to add on to that, you know, after taking those breaths, I think changing the way that we think like that, having a gratitude practice, so to speak, so that when we're sitting there and we take those breaths and we're observing our mind and we're noticed that we're going into the negative spiral, maybe it's fear of the future or regret of the past. Those are usually the patterns that we see in humans, right? We have this kind of story that we're telling ourselves and that we can actually shift that and go from negative thinking and fearful thinking to replacing those thoughts with positive thoughts. Is there something you can give our viewers that they can use today, right now, if they've never used a breathing technique before, if they've never done meditation before, that combines this mental mindful shift at the same time while they're breathing that they can use? Is there something you could offer our listeners that they can use, you know, right now if they're listening? Yeah. If, I mean, if they're listening right now, I would just invite them to close their eyes for a moment, as long as they're not driving. <laughs> And to breathe, <laughs> breathe in through their nose and out through their mouth. And if they notice a thought that comes up, right, a thought of like, I can't do this. This isn't for me. I need, I have work to do. This isn't working out. You know, whatever that negative thought is that comes up, that you notice it, you observe it, like you're the mountain and that thought is the rain. And then you shift it. And you think of something you're grateful for about that particular situation. You know, I get to go to work. I have a job today. It might not be the job I love, but I do have a job. You know, I get to be with my kids. They're driving me nuts, but I do have these children. What's good about them that I can see? Where can I put my positive energy? And then come back to the breath, you know, one more time. Take that breath in and let it out. There is this thing, it's called prana energy, and babies actually do it. It's where you breathe from your stomach. You can't think a thought and focus on breathing from your stomach, which is one of the great things about this. So you can always pull that energy from your stomach, breathe from your stomach, babies do it. That's just how they breathe. That's how, they, that's how we naturally came into this world, you know, breathing from our stomachs, where you can actually feel that energy go from the middle of your abdomen all the way up to your chest and out. One of the things that really helped me out, I got into meditation a, a long time ago. You have to act as if your life depends on it. Let's say you were going to die unless you were able to be here, be now, be in this calm, steady place. Then could you do it? If all you had was right now, are you going to worry about what could happen? Are you going to worry about what has already happened? Or are you going to be here right now? And that is definitely so important. I'm, I'm happy that you actually teach that and teach that to, to children and, and to companies, different people around, around the world and stuff, because it definitely does follow patience and being here right now. And I think one of the most important things is to not get attached to the outcome. Never be attached to what has happened or what is going to happen because everything is already happening for you and everything is okay. Let's say you have negative thoughts and you can't even move to not thinking anymore, less alone meditation because you have so much anxiety. Start with one of the great words, great quotes 
actually heard from Oprah Winfrey this year down here in Colorado Springs at Colorado College is things are always working out for me. I stole that from Oprah and that's my mantra. And I really truly believe that. And I think you guys can adopt that same strategy. If you can't go into a straight meditation from just not thinking, start with things are always working out for me or they are working out. Things will be fine. Everything is okay. I will do whatever it is I'm trying to do. I am fine. I am great. But things are always working out for me is something that I have adopted personally. And it's always helped me out when I don't know what's going to happen, when I'm trying to figure out something or when I want to do something. Things are always working out for me. But yeah, thank you so much, Laura, for touching on that. Being here right now, mindfulness, being here in, in the present is something very important. You can have all the money in the world. You can have all the success in the world. But, you know, if, if you weren't here in the present, then what does it all matter? What are some of the things that you've discovered about your own self-discovery in these personas as a teacher, as a discipline educator, um, that has really uh, tested the two elements of patience? Patience, the podcast, is predicated upon this you know, virtue of patience. And to break down the element of patience into two parts to give the listeners a, a little bit of insight into how I've been trying to use patience in my life, the two elements being the reaction and response to a difficult situation, to a challenge. So your reaction immediate, which is positive or negative, and then whether you're going forward and past or you're retreating back away from and the second element being the transformation to the other side of patience, which is where growth starts to occur. So as a, as a teacher and discipline educator and a person who's been hosting these workshops for mindfulness and parenting and equanimity, and as an entrepreneur, what do you think were some of the, the greater tests that you've had in your career in self-discovery and turning this business into what it is and stepping away from teaching that really pushed you, you forward into the space that you're in today? I think that being a full-time mom is um, one of the areas where I've had to have more patience than I ever thought was possible. <laughs> it's just such a, a hard job, you know, and you don't, you don't know. I mean, really for me, I had this kind of like fantasy of what it would be like to have children and then the reality of raising children. It's a blessing. I mean, it's one of the biggest joys of my life and it's also hard. It's hard physically, you know, because there's a lack of sleep and there's a lack of personal time and space. And then it's also exhausting mentally and emotionally. And, you know, what I found to be true and what I've read in other, uh, in the literature is that, you know, children will always bring out in us on a kind of spiritual energetic level, what we need to work on in ourselves. And so I remember as a kid, I often didn't feel heard by my parents. And when I would be, when I felt upset, my mom would go in her room and just close the door. And then when I was done feeling upset, she would come out, but there would never be a discussion of my feelings. And so as a result, I could tend to get really angry as a child, but I grew through that. You know, I, I was a very patient teacher. I didn't really have feelings of anger come up, but then as a adult, as a mother, my children, when they would act out, I would notice that I would start to get angry. And it was those same feelings that I had when I was young of like, I don't feel heard, but your kids aren't going to always listen to you, right? That's a normal part of their growth and development. And so where mindfulness comes in and patience comes in for me as a parent in that light is how can I not take my old stuff, right? My baggage, my old past schema, how do I not bring that out on you? And how do I sit with that feeling of, ooh, I don't feel heard right now and not react by yelling? And what I hear from parents over and over again, you know, and all of the seminars and workshops that I do is that they want to yell less at their kids. They want to enjoy them more, but they haven't felt like they, they don't feel like they can because they feel like they're never listening to them or they don't have good behavior. And so what we work on a lot is how do you just own your own feelings and thoughts and reactions and not 
act out in a way that you feel bad about later with your children. Uh, and then that translates when I go into businesses, I talk to them, it's the same thing. Like, how do we sit with our thoughts and feelings and not take that on on our coworkers? <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know, in these interpersonal relationships and in the, in these dynamics. So, uh, it's a, it's a learning experience. It continues to be a learning experience. I mean, it's really a daily practice, I think. How old are your children? Four and a half and six and a half. Four and a half and six and a half. Okay. So fairly young for the mm -hmm. most part, as yeah. they get older, how are you going to not project what you want them to be or how you see them onto them? Mm, great question. <laughs> you know, tough questions. This, this tough, is the tough questions we yeah, ask on patients. The podcast. Yeah, I like that. Uh, you know, I mean, we let our children have their own experiences. I think it's really important for me as a parent to not protect them always from their failures or their mistakes or their missteps, but we kind of hold a container where they can have their experiences, but we can support them along the way. So for us, what that looks like is a lot of family meetings. We set aside time every week to sit down as a family and we, and that's where we bring things up like, hey, I noticed that at school you've been having a hard time with a certain friend. What's going on with that? And then we let our children talk about the experience they're having, and then we problem solve with them. And so even at a young age, at four years old, my daughter can come up to me and say, you know, I'm having a hard time staying in my room at night and falling asleep. Can we talk about that? And then we'll have a family meeting and we'll talk about solutions and we'll try those solutions. And so as they get older, we just want to continue on this path where they are in charge of their own kind of destiny, right? But we're going to support them along the way. We have rules in our family that we need to follow and we're going to help them problem solve. So we're trying to teach this higher level of critical thinking. Do you see anything for them though? Do you have any, is there something that when they grow up, they're going to feel like, you know, I know mom wants me to do this, but I really want to do this. Oh, you know, I mean, no, not at this point. I, I think that as long as they continue on this path of growing emotionally and having their own sort of mindful practice and being aware of their actions and consequences that their actions may have, you know, as long as they continue on that path, then I really trust that they're going to make good choices for their future. So Laura, would you agree as a parent, as a positive discipline educator, as mm -hmm. a former teacher, person who's running workshops for parents and, and mindfulness for all, would you say it's, it's really centric on setting a series of impossible tasks that might undermine your child's self-confidence or is it more imperative to build a relationship on your interest in the highest mode of being for your child and offering challenges that are precisely optimized to their ability? what they can currently do, what they can transform, improve upon based upon their current abilities. Oh yeah, I think it's so important to meet your child developmentally where they are. And you know, I, and for me that I find that out by reading books about developmentally, you know, the ages, the stage that they're in in their life. So I know, you know, what's reasonable. I think a lot of times as parents, we have expectations of our children that they should be able to do certain things or have certain manners or act in a certain way that's unreasonable because it's not developmentally appropriate. Absolutely. And even more so just, you know, beyond just the, uh, you know, developmental stages, which is super important. I encourage every parent to know the difference between zero to three, four to seven, seven to nine and nine and through early teenage and adulthood, certainly look into that as just a very precursor to being a parent. A lot of people mm -hmm. just jump into being a parent and we all sort of, you know, acknowledge that that's acceptable, but I really do think it's really important for parents to take a step back before making that big leap and understand that the different stages really do correlate and zero to three and seven are the most impactful years as adults and all the emotional and all the, you know, intellectual comes from that very, just being present with your child 
from zero mm-hmm. to three, even just as a dad, if you can't relate as easily, many fathers are not as immediately as involved in the emotional relationship of a one to three year old, let's say, or an infant as a mother would be. But even if you just set tasks for them, whatever age and developmental stage that they're at, that'll ensure a higher chance of success. It certainly takes a level of wisdom and humility to optimize those challenges. It takes a little bit of self-reflection inward to really create the challenges that really stretch what they're capable of doing in a functional and feasible way. Even if that means as individuals and as parents, we have to go to very dark places ourselves and go into the deep depths of who we are, even if it's embarrassing, even if we feel ashamed, deal with our inequities and really face that you're a parent and you're providing guidance and you might not have all the answers and you might not have an answer for X. And our ego and our pride often makes it very difficult for us to get down there in the trenches and really accept those things about yourself because that's a self-reflection of humility. And it takes a great deal of patience to go there as a person or a parent. So I just think that's super important. I'm sure you could appreciate it as a mom that we all have inequities and strengths and one Mm -hmm. parent's better at one thing, another parent's better at another thing. And oftentimes we might have to reach out into the community, into the greater world. We have the internet now and all these great vehicles and whether it's a coach or it's a tutor, we shouldn't be ashamed. We should remove the stigma that is a parent has all the answers and that here's the blueprint. And if you don't come up with yours, mine will work for you. I think our community has changed a lot. I've noticed, you know, domestically that in the 80s and 90s there was a really strong robust community and there still is in a lot of places like in the midwest and i'm sure in california the east coast there's plenty of great communities but i think a lot of people are afraid or many people are afraid to reach out into the greater world through the internet because of the scary you know boogeyman that lies on the other side of their computer or just go beyond personal referrals for people they can get involved in their children's lives because we are a singular community that is growing more comfortable this concept so a lot of people don't don't know this but we do edit these podcasts don't cut me out on this donnie do not <laughs> i promise <laughs> we'll cut this part out my man look i a lot of parents hate when i say this but just coming from a giving you i'm closer to a child than all of us on this podcast right now so giving you that perspective to all my parents out there who like when it goes to like wanting your child to, to stretch and do more and to give more of themselves, but also not being that, that parent where like you get your child to hate that sport or hate doing this and hate doing that because you push them so hard. Don't clap. <laughs> do not clap. Okay. Like literally they do one small thing and you clap. Do not clap. There is always more. They can always walk a little bit further. They can always talk a little bit better. They can always go a little bit further. Do not clap at every little thing that your child does because in the long run, it's not going to make them better. It's actually only going to hinder them. But if you wait it out and you're patient enough, You give them some time and then you clap. Then they know, oh, wow, okay. If I just keep going a little bit further, if I stretch more, mommy's going to love what I'm doing. Mommy's going to like it, you know. I, And it's that's just one of those those, those tactics, too, like that are behind the scenes. If you really want to see them stretch far, if you really want to see them growth and go beyond measure, don't clap because in the end, they really do want to make you happy. I know growing up... um, I feel like that's, you know, if you have a good relationship with your parents, that's that's really what we all want. We all want to be accepted and be heard like Laura was talking about earlier. And we 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 want them to be proud. We want our parents to, to be proud of us. So <laughs> definitely use that. All my parents <laughs> out there, new parents, don't clap in the beginning at every single thing. Just just wait it out. Just wait out. I'm not saying don't you you can't get excited. I'm not saying don't be happy for them. I'm just saying, don't clap. That's all. Don't clap. Don't make it a little bit bigger than what it is for them. Let them know, give them the understanding that they can always do better. And there's always more to go. There's always more room to grow in life. Sammy G, I think that's a really good point. I mean, what you're talking about is this idea of praise versus encouragement. 
And so a lot of times we see parents and they give a lot of praise and praise would be like, you're a good boy. You're a good girl, right? You took that step. You're a good boy. You ate your food. Good boy. But oftentimes with praise, what comes on the other side of it is the negative, which is you did something wrong. You're bad, right? Don't do that. That's a bad boy or that's a bad girl. Um, and so as parents, this idea of cultivating encouragement instead of just praise can actually go really far. And so, ab so we want to celebrate their successes and we want to celebrate those steps and them doing well. And we also want to give them the intern the language so that they can have internal motivation. And so that's where encouragement can come from more of you drew that picture. You must feel so proud of yourself. I see that you spent a really long time working on that, right? So there's this kind of subtle way where we're able to encourage them and really support them in these steps along the way without overdoing it in praise. It's absolutely a balance, right? Like we don't want to give out trophies for doing nothing, but at the same time, I think we want to reinforce every great thing that is done that at mm -hmm. a very young age happens because that is going to create that that new level of reinforcement as an adult, that they're going to want gratitude either given to them or given back into the world because their mother was just so, you know, enthusiastic about them opening the door for somebody at the age of like four. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, each family will have their own thing. Maybe it's, maybe for Sammy G, it's not clapping. And maybe for someone else, it's the uh, the attaboys. I mean, for me, I would say I probably do clap a lot for my children, but I also try and instill these values of like, I'm proud of you, but really you're proud of yourself, right? You feel good. I always want to reflect it back so that they start to really cultivate that internal drive um, to be self-motivated instead of the reward in which is an external motivating factor. And we find that a lot, not only for kids, but then we see that a lot for adults and companies, right? Like if you do well, then you get this external reward or we take something away. And we really want to focus on this internal motivation. I like that. Sam, as a child, do you remember getting either one or the other, both a little bit more, a little bit less? Were you given a lot of reinforcement? It wasn't tough, but it wasn't easy my parents were just like you can do whatever you want to do whatever you do you, you put your mind to it you can make it happen whenever i did great they were proud they were happy i, I like the quote that you should face defeat and face wins the exact same way and i feel like mm -hmm. that's how my parents raised me to if you're doing great you're doing what you're supposed to be doing so yeah you should feel good because this is what this life is about feeling good but it doesn't, you shouldn't feel any better than when you do something wrong or, or if you do something bad. I mean, it's, it's okay. It's all, it's all perfectly fine. You know, if you win a game, awesome. You guys won. Go win the next one. If you lose a game, it's okay. You lost. You have a chance to, to get better and to win another one. Um, so there's never, for me at least growing up, there was never really um, either or. I, I mean, if I got straight A's, they were like, okay, awesome. Like, awesome. Like, let's, let's try to do it next semester. Like, but this was great. I knew you could always do it. If I got a C or a D, it was never like, oh my gosh, you got a C or a D. I can't believe it. It was just like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all right. You just, just got to study harder. <laughs> you just got to do a little bit better. Nothing was ever too exaggerated for me. I could tell my dad, like, oh, hey, I made my first, you know, I made my first 10,000 from my show. He, he'll be happy for me, but it won't be too crazy. And if I say, hey, I lost my first 20,000 because of these shows, it won't be, you know, there won't be too, too hard on me either about it. So I definitely do think, you know, balance is, is key. And I, I love what Laura was saying, how it's not about the external things. It's about the internal things. And how you feel about that. I think that that's perfect. Like that was exactly what I was trying to say. Laura just took it to another, to another level and just spoke it from all the mother's perspectives out there, which I love. And I think that is, is great. Like, yeah, like it's not about the external, it's about the internal 
And that's really what it's all about. If you can somehow teach awareness and teach mindfulness to children, then I think we have a bright future ahead of us. That starts with us, right? I mean, so often I have parents come to me and say, I want my kids to be more mindful. I want my teenager to practice mindfulness. And so my question to them is always, well, how much mindfulness and meditation and self-awareness practice are you doing yourself in your own home as the parent? Because our children do what they see. And so really with us, we start it and then our children follow suit because inherently children are very mindful. You know, they're, they really are aware and present in the moment. And so we help cultivate that for them. For all the parents out there, for all the people looking for more mindfulness, looking for a little bit more equanimity, people who are curious about positive discipline education, where can they find you, reach out to you, and really dive deep into finding calm in the chaos of their daily life? Yeah, so I post daily on Instagram and Facebook, and it's always in the context of mindfulness, parenting tools, meditation, you know, kind of everything we've been talking about today. And so that's Laura Lynn Knight, L-I-N-N, and then K-N-I-G-H-T. And then my website is lauralynnight.com, and I have a daily blog, and then I have a monthly newsletter where I'll go into this kind of information a little bit more in depth. Reach out to Ms. Laura Lynn Knight. She is an excellent teacher, excellent discipline educator. She has been bringing more mindfulness not only into her life, into parents from all different walks of life. If you're interested in finding out how to calm some of that noise in your life, feel free to ask questions if you're really concerned about your own self-identity as a parent. Laura has a ton of experience in this field as a teacher and as a mindfulness uh, expert. So please go ahead and reach out to her socials. Thank you so much, Laura, for joining us on this episode. A lot of times we get so caught up in life and we forget the true meaning of just being happy and being at peace and being at ease. You don't want to be in a constant struggle, you know? I mean, I think we all struggle with many different things, but there's a difference between fighting it and actually just going through it with ease. And I was working this job and there was a, a new manager of mine and there's this older guy who has who had been working there. He was about maybe in his 40s, 50s and he was just like, man, Sam, you're like, like you're great at your job. Like, like you're awesome. And I was like, yeah, dude, like, I know I'm, I'm pretty good, huh? Like, he was like, yeah, you like, you really are. You see Randy over there? And I was like, yeah, what about Randy? He's good too, right? I'm like, yeah, he's, yeah, he, he's pretty good, but he's been, you know, he's been working here for a long time. And he's like, yeah, but it, that's not it. He said, you do what you do and you're sweating. You break a sweat, you know, like you hustle for you hustle. And then he goes, Randy does what you do. And he, and he, he just has a beer afterwards. Like, like it's nothing, you know, like he does it with ease. And then I was like, wow, I like, I totally get like something clicked. I was like, wow, I totally get what, what you're saying. Like I'm struggling, I'm struggling to like be the best that I can be while well, he's just being the best that he can be easily. So I definitely want to motivate everyone to just be the best that you can be easily. Don't struggle. Don't fight it. You know, practice that mindfulness, that meditation. Focus on your breathing. Be patient and understand that it's all working out for you. It's all going to work out. Your kids are going to be great. You are going to get into that college. You are going to get that job that you wanted. There is so much business headed in your direction. You know, don't stress about it. Don't worry about it. Don't fight it. Live in the now and know that it's all coming your way. Thank you again, guys, for joining us on Patience, the podcast. This is Sammy G and Donnie D. This wraps up episode six. Guys, do not forget, patience is not just about 
putting in the, the effort to be aware, but it's also about putting in the work afterward, after you transform to that other side. Laura, thank you for sharing your breathing techniques with us. Thank you for giving us a little bit of insight into mindfulness and equanimity. Parents and friends from all walks, please be sure to reach out to Laura uh, to find out more. Laura, thank you very much for joining us for episode six. Thank you for having me. And we'll see you guys on episode seven.